And welcome to the Research Works podcast, brought to you in association with Curtin University and the Healthy Strides Foundation. Your hosts are Dr. Dana Poole and Dr. Ashley Thornton, and together we will interview world-leading researchers in the area of child health to support your practice in being more evidence-based. The team at the Research Works podcast acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land and waters on which we live and work. We pay our respects to all First Nations peoples, elders past and present, and would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we record this podcast each week, the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation. We recognise their continued connection to this beautiful budja we call home. Welcome to another episode of the Research Works podcast. I am so very, very excited about the guest we have on today, um, mainly because of the the influence he has had on my work you know, like from over t- 10 years ago. So it's been a long time coming. Yeah, he <laughs> is a bit of a superstar, that's for sure. Welcome, Dr. Mark Peterson. Thank you guys so much. That's a very generous introduction. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys today. No, we're going to gush a little bit more still. Yeah, Mark, um, we've been looking forward to our opportunity to speak with you ever since you were back in Perth a few years ago for um, our Oz Academy conference. And that was just before the pandemic hit and closed all our borders. And, you know, I think we thought it would be uh, sooner that we'd get to see each other in person. But we're really excited to have the opportunity to speak to you online today. Um, we're going to be talking about a paper that Mark referred to in his keynote presentation at that conference. It's titled Psychological Morbidity Among Adults with Cerebral Palsy and Spina Bifida, and it was published in Psychological Medicine back in 2020. For our listeners, let's tell you a little bit about Mark. Dr. Mark Peterson is an Associate Professor at the University of Michigan in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. His work focuses on, an un- on understanding factors that influence health and life expectancy in people with disabilities. Specifically, his research has been devoted to physical activity epidemiology and behavioural interventions for the treatment and prevention of obesity and related cardiometabolic diseases, frailty, functional motor declines and early mortality. Dr. Peterson's work has certainly been very thought-provoking and has initiated a lot of very important discussions around identifying precision strategies to prevent metabolic dysregulation and secondary musculoskeletal pathology in individuals with neuromuscular impairments. It's a very, very impressive overview of the work that Mark has done. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so you can all see why this is right up our alley when it comes to you know a, an area that we're very interested in. And, and just to gush a little bit more, as I sort of spoke to Mark a little bit earlier like his work has been really influential it's kind of just set me on a path from a career perspective and to be able to meet and talk to someone who's actually done that is very very special so yeah we're gonna no, I'm not sure we're quite done gushing just yet Mark <laughs> but um yeah there's a little bit of fangirling <laughs> happening here <laughs> so I no, guess thank you guys so much <laughs> no we love that you've, uh, you're speaking with us I guess you know we've just spoken about the fact that you're from Michigan so the the time Time difference is quite quite a big difference, isn't it? it? Is, so yeah. thank you for making the effort. It's later in the night there, early in the hours for us here, but I'm glad we're able to make it work. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you guys for the opportunity. It's it's really a rare opportunity to get the um the 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 time to to disseminate kind of the information that we published in papers yeah. and we talk about in conferences, but it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't usually have this, this, this opportunity to talk, you know, and have a podcast like this. So thank you guys very much. Oh, that's awesome. It's mm-hmm. really cool. <laughs> so Mark, we normally like to start our podcast episodes with a, a bit of an icebreaker question before we get into the, the nitty gritty of the, <laughs> the paper and the science. And today we thought that we would ask you, what was the last song that you listened to? Um, okay, so I had to go back to my iTunes and I looked up the last song and I'm going to be embarrassed to say this, but I had just downloaded Bon Jovi, Wanted Dead or Alive on oh my, my iTunes account. Goodness. It's a really way throwback from like mid 80s, That's but that so is great. a solid, solid song. Yeah. <laughs> I would call that a classic. That's right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Nothing to be embarrassed no, about there. I'm, I'm horrified by that. That's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is very cool. Like 
I grew up in the 80s and so, you know, the 80s music is very influential <laughs> and if we've all noticed, it's okay. all come back. Yeah. It's all yeah. come back. And the worst thing is when young kids call it vintage. I'm like, oh, oh shut no. up. No. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> Plus, you haven't heard our yeah. answers yet, Mark, so. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's nowhere near as cool. <laughs> Mine's not as cool. Well, I think it's cool for kids these days and, but I don't know any of the words. I'm not a really good at word songs, mm-hmm. so I'm, I'm more like a melody person, but I just, um, Listen to to BTS Butter. <laughs> you know that one? No. Hot like butter, something something criminal undercover. <laughs> well, BTS oh, I is heard that either. they're a very big um, Korean like oh, boy band yes. kind of thing. And I oh, okay. so because okay. I grew up in the eighties, which meant the nineties were influential, which mm-hmm. meant boy mm-hmm. bands were really big. You know, yep. Backstreet Boys, NSYNC. So yep. BTS is the modern day. Is it okay? Yeah. I'm getting an education here. This I'm forty is... years old and I still listen to BTS. All right, Ash. Oh, what's I yours? <laughs> I've been putting this off. Okay, so. <laughs> Um, full disclosure, when I <laughs> planned this question, we were going to speak to you a few weeks ago, Mark, and I had planned to listen to something really kind of, you know, hip and cool, cool. so that I could yeah, talk yeah. about that on my way in. That <laughs> we had to reschedule. So, on my, and I forgot that this is what we were talking about this morning. <laughs> so, Gosh. I am. Um, I indulged in um, some show tunes on my way to the podcast recording this morning. Show tunes? What's yeah, that? I was listening to um, the Wicked soundtrack. Oh, yeah. Oh, no way. Yeah, That's cool. And I, I was belting out a bit of Defying Gravity. On my- <laughs> That's so cool. Can you give us a sample? Definitely not. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> Oh, I well, love this morning that. on the radio, this, this morning on the radio, they announced that it was the 25th anniversary of the Hanson's Mbop no. uh, song that came out, yes. and I was like, "Oh, I'm so old! Yeah. I can't believe I remember that song." Yeah. <laughs> I remember that was number one for so long. They're coming Wasn't to it? Perth well, soon. Yeah. Are they really? Yeah. Oh, the, yeah. They're still a thing. I didn't realize that. <laughs> they're Not making that. themselves a thing. Yeah. <laughs> wow! Wow! Yeah, well, okay, okay. now that we've been in our uh, music history uh, and there's no judgment, you know, no judgment, I think that's the main space. thing. Yeah. Let me give you guys a bit okay, of a summary sure. about what it is we're going to be centering our conversation around. So this is the first and largest study to examine longitudinal trajectories of psychological morbidity among adults living with cerebral palsy or spina bifida. The objective of this study was to compare the incidence of and adjusted hazards for psychological morbidities among adults with and without cerebral palsy and spina bifida. In this retrospective cohort study, the study, the team found that adults with cerebral palsy and spina bifida had a higher four-year incidence of any psychological morbidity, that being 38.8% versus 24.2% when compared to adults without cerebral palsy or spina bifida, and these differences were to a clinically meaningful extent. So this work highlights the need to develop clinical screening and early interventions to reduce the risk of disease onset and progression in these higher risk populations. Thanks for that, Dana. No Um, problem. And Mark, to start with, I was hoping we could set the scene a little bit before we get into the outcomes of this paper. Um, There's been a significant amount of work that's occurred recently on the lifespan health and developmental trajectories of individuals with cerebral palsy and spina bifida. Could you talk us through what we currently know about these populations as as children grow and become adults? Yeah, I mean that's a, such a good way to start, actually, because because both both conditions and, and most of my work is is around cerebral palsy, but spina bifida is another. It's less common, but it's another pediatric onset condition that yeah. actually. Uh, arises during pregnancy. Mm. And in and it's collectively considered to be a pediatric condition. I mean, those those most of the work, all of the the research and clinical care surrounding people with CP has been heavy focused on pediatric care and research. Yeah. And so um, only over the last decade or so has the the growth in the literature and the state of the literature been to understand kind of lifespan care and lifespan research around health outcomes and, and, and in many cases, health disparities facing individuals with CP, cerebral palsy, and spina bifida. And so, you know, that's where that's where a lot of the work that I've done over my, my career, short career over the last 10 years has, has been focused on is trying to understand, you know, how individuals with CP and spina bifida 
um, experience age related disease and, and disparities in healthcare. Mm. Yeah. And um, Mark, when we talk about some of the things that, you know, start to change or potentially, you know, without the the right kind of intervention decline, we're talking about things like muscle and, and bone development, aren't we, first of all, and then the kind of the secondary factors that kind of flow on from inadequate muscle and bone development. Is that right? Yeah. And, and actually, a lot of the medical jargon around this population has been in, in, in the context of a premature aging or accelerated aging. Yeah. And while that's a kind of a nebulous term, basically what you can imagine is that is representative of musculoskeletal decline early in life, but yeah. then also risk for, you know, non-communicable diseases like cardiovascular disease and dementia, um, metabolic disease, diabetes, for example. Mm. And, and so these are conditions that we often associate with aging, but they, they seem to be happening in, in, especially in, in folks living with pediatric onset disabilities or much earlier in life than mm. we would consider to be an age-related disease. Mm. Mm-hmm. And this whole talk about, you know, secondary chronic diseases, I think is something that um, has really, I think your work has really brought this to the forefront recently. And and I guess there was just a few things I wanted to ask you around that before we get into the sort of the psychological morbidity side of things, is that we talk about this um, premature sarcopenia. Can you just talk us through a little bit about what that really entails? Because I think you've kind of summarized it a bit before, but we see that mm. terminology as well. How, how does you know, sarcopenia actually fit in with all of this conversation? And so for, for your listeners, I mean, sarcopenia is something that we would consider to be an aging related condition of sure. just loss of muscle tissue, right? Yeah. A loss of function of muscle tissue. Yeah. But, but actually, even in children with CP, there, there's, there's, there is a blunted uh, growth of muscle. And so they don't, they don't obtain the amount of muscle mass and bone tissue that a typically developed, you know, regularly ambulatory child without CP would expect to have. And so, mm. so what happens is it's not just a premature uh, sarcopenia. It's, yeah. it's that there is a, a lack of development early in life. So that's kind of sets the trajectory to yeah. be less mm. across the lifespan. Yeah. And, and, and for folks who don't exercise or are highly sedentary, I mean, that that just worsens with age. I mm. mean, it, it does for everybody, but yeah. especially for, for individuals with, with a physical disability like CP, yeah. um, there is there is a high risk for loss, you know, l- low muscle mass yeah. attainment just to begin with, but then yeah. loss of muscle mass at an accelerated rate. Yeah. Mm. And I guess that's sort of what we've spoken about so much in the podcast of the last year. You know, we've spoken to researchers who are just so interested in looking at how we can build muscle mass as early yeah. as possible. You know, the work that Sean is doing. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Trying to change that trajectory. That's right. At the offset, and yeah, trying to almost. You're talking about a. a if you're looking at a trajectory, you're talking about a, a line that's you know relatively flat, I yeah, guess. Yeah. Whereas you know they're trying to make it as steep as possible at the start, to, so right. that you can yeah, yeah see the benefits of that for for longer. Yeah, and I think we're from yeah, there. Yeah, almost if you think of like improving the the apex of that curve yeah. Yeah. In, in early life, you know, in the second or third decades of life, and then trying to do something to keep that, that line from yeah. going down so fast mm-hmm. with age. Um, I mean, we, that's, that's the case for everybody, but I mean, really for people with, with cerebral palsy, it's extraordinarily important to, to do both of those things, intervene mm-hmm. early mm-hmm. and then very often. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, that's a good way to put it. So I guess now from there, you note in this paper that there's been really few studies examining psychological morbidity among adults with cerebral palsy and spina bifida. Now, why is this the case? Why is it like, you know, why is it so, firstly, why is it so important for us to understand this and, and why haven't we looked at this before? Yeah, that, I mean, it's such a good question. I, I have uh, historically, as a physiologist, I have I have focused on basically everything from the neck down. And um, mm-hmm. I mean, we've we've studied we've studied extensively across organ systems. Um, you know, the, the 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 health effects of having cerebral palsy across the lifespan. But you know, when you are confronted with patient after patient and parent after parent 
talking about and asking about, well, what about my, what about my mental health? What about mm. my child's mental health? What about my adult child's mental yeah. health? I, I seem to think that there might be some, some issues here that is not being addressed at their, at their, you know, their, their annual medical visit, their general practitioner visit. But I'm starting to worry that there, there might be some issues, especially because they, they start to recognize that there's a pattern of pain and sleep deprivation or sleep disorders. And then also, um, concerns rela- related to anxiety and depression, mm. um, they, they, these start to, these start to pile up, you know? Mm. And, and so I, I'm not a psychologist, but I, but we have the ability to put together teams of people and, um, robust, uh, analytic procedure to, to actually start to look at, you know, psychological outcomes and mental health disorders. And that, that's kind of the, the, the origin of this research was yeah. it really came down to, patient and parent vignettes coming in over and over and over and saying like, well, what do we, what do we have to, what do we need to do about this? And Mm. do we have to worry about their mental health as they get older? And as parents, obviously, as they get older, Mm -hmm. they're concerned for their, their child's, you know, their, their child's mental health across the lifespan. And so, you know, even though I'm not a neuropsychologist, we, we have the ability to assemble you know, some really robust studies to, to yeah. look at these outcomes. Um, and so it's kind of extending the work from organ systems into a whole system is like, there's a brain connected to this person. There's, yeah. there's, there's psychology connected to yeah. all the, the whole body is, is of concern. So it, it made a perfect sense to begin to look, you know, upstream and above the neck. Yeah, absolutely. So let's start to unpack the the details of the study a little bit then, Mark. So you used a retrospective cohort study design. Can you explain to us and our listeners what this means and what kind of data you were including in the study? Sure. So because in the United States, especially, I mean, you guys in Australia have done a significantly better job and, and folks from Scandinavian countries have registries. But in the United States, we do not have a CP registry, oh, um, not wow. for children, not yep. for adults. We don't even have good clinical cohorts. Um, you know, mo- most institutions do not see adults with CP. So we are forced to figure out alternative strategies at collecting data. Yeah. And in this case, uh, I, I mean, I, as I said to Dana earlier, I, I, I went back and did a, a master's in biostatistics, um, largely because I, I felt very compelled to try to understand how to be able to leverage large data. Yeah. And in this case, um, we were able to access um, a medical claims data from insur- the public insurance provider. And so, um, and, and for this particular study, we used um, uh, diagnostic codes to identify a cohort of adults with CP and also an adult, a cohort of adults with spina bifida um, who were privately insured adults in the United States. So for, for the folks that don't understand or don't know about the way our healthcare system works is you, you can obtain insurance through private insurance, which is usually done through your 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 occupation, your yeah. job or your mm-hmm. um, mar- marriage, but also people have the option to be on federal insurance, which is Medicare and Medicaid. Yeah. In this case, we leveraged large data from a private insurance company mm-hmm. and that provided access to just about 80 million adults in the United States. Wow. And so we built a cohort of a fairly large cohort of adults with CP and spina bifida to, to do this study. Mm. Wow, that's that's really. I mean, even and was yeah. it just? Did you say sorry? It was just one private insurance um, kind of funder that you were looking at. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We have multiple uh, private insurance providers in yeah. the United States. This one would represent, which I, I'm, I'm actually not able to say which insurance company, no. but it's 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 a company that provides a, a substantial number of, of adults, uh, people in the United States. So just over 80 million people who yeah. obtain their insurance through this particular provider. Yeah, so that's a fairly comprehensive sample that you've been able to to work with there. Um, and so you included uh, people over the age of 18 years um, and you did, uh, you embedded a, a longitudinal kind of follow-up within that, didn't you? Yep. And we, we specifically excluded people with CP or spina bifida who do not have a substantial amount of follow-up mm, okay. and also for folks who did not, who had 
presence of psychological morbidities during the baseline period, which means they're when they were yeah. enrolled on the plan, they had prevalent diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when we look at the outcome, the incident outcomes, those are those are essentially disease free survival of those outcomes, you know, after their plan enrollment. And so what we've what we've done subsequently is we've looked at basically anybody who had presence of of baseline prevalent um, morbidity and that there's a huge number of people that we had to exclude. Mm -hmm. And so even though they have the, the, the data that, that you, that you cited was a much higher incident yeah. um, psychological morbidity, the, the actual prevalent psychological morbidity was quite high as well. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And you also had a, a random sample of members, I think it was about 20% um, without cerebral palsy or spina bifida. Could you just explain why you did this? So it's very, it's very normal when you have a sample size as large as 80 million people mm -hmm. to then just take a 20% random sample yeah. um, to create a control group because they, if, if you think 20% of 80 million, that's quite representative of the Fairly population in general. Number. You don't yeah. actually, <laughs> you don't need to do the full 80 million to, no. to get at what the, what the, what the, what the real mm -hmm. science looks like. Um, and it just, it, it helps to decrease the, the throughput of the analysis and mm -hmm. helps to, um, <laughs> to reduce the complexity of, of, of actually mining through the data of, of, yeah. of 80 million people. Oh, so okay. that, that's, that's the whole purpose of doing it. I mean, and most people, when they do large data work, they don't, they don't have to do a full claim of all of the people, yeah, you know, they, yeah, you can take yeah. a 20% random representative sample. Yeah, I think that's definitely <laughs> fair enough with a, a sample of 80 million. It's just quite amazing we talk about those numbers. We're so used to in our field of allied health and the kind of studies we do, we don't have big big numbers like this. So this is truly big data. So it's really yeah. impressive and it's it's great to learn about this and in terms of the kind of strength of data that you can gain from from this kind of analysis. So Mark, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about you know the actual outcomes. I know you use the ICD nine and ten codes, um, and you looked at the sort of the incidence of of um, uh, psychological morbidity. Can you just talk us through a bit? of, you know, what kind of psychological morbidities uh, that you are actually specifically looking for? Um, we, we used, actually, we used um, CDC's de definition of psychological morbidities across different categories. Okay. And so, you know, those included things like, it could include in, in anything from um, post-traumatic stress syndrome to major depression, major depression, anxiety, um, mood affective disorders, alcohol and substance abuse disorders, I mean, and across the gamut, and we tried to wow. be as inclusive mm -hmm. and comprehensive as possible, yeah. um, mostly insomnia. I mean, so we really tried to include as many psychologic outcomes as, as we could, because it, it, it's important to understand the, the breadth of psychological. Yeah. The, one of the first studies I did on this was with Jennifer Ryan in the UK, and oh, we looked yeah. at just depression and anxiety. Yeah. And while I think that those are two of the highest burden psychologic morbidities, um, that does not cover all of the, the breadth of what I think is important for, for CP and spina bifida and especially CP yeah. because, yeah. because there is issues with, with respect to kind of childhood onset mm. um, stigma that is associated with having a disability. Mm -hmm. um, there is issues with, with respect to pain and, yeah. um, you know, dystonia, things that cause issues yeah. with sleep. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so we, we included centralized pain, even though yeah. I, I know that's not a psychological outcome. Centralized pain is an extremely important element um, that leads to, in a causal pathway, potentially psychological morbidity. Yeah, mm. sure. Can I just ask a question, um, whether I'm not sure if you were able to tell this from the data or not, but was the reason why these individuals sought medical intervention, which is why it's recorded under this insurance um, uh, claims, was it for those reasons? Like, was it for the psychological morbidity sort of reasons or was it found sort of incidentally while they're treating something else? Like, is there any way of knowing that? 
That's like such an awesome question that you just asked <laughs> because we don't we don't actually know the answer that, okay. to that. I, yeah. I have no way of knowing the granularity of the patient level information. And yeah. and actually what I would say to that to 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 be perfectly honest with you yeah. is because this is diagnostic codes yeah. and we know that people with CP, especially adults with CP, when they come to clinic, there is a huge list of things that need to be addressed. And so if you think that this is an actual representation of the real problem in yeah. the real world, yeah. I, I would say it's probably an enormous underestimation, right. if yeah. anything. Mm -hmm. and, and so within the limitations of large data, we, we have to apologize basically for some of the patient level granular data or information that we do, we, we yeah, just have no just idea. Yep. Yeah. Um, you just have you have no way of knowing what those things are. But but I but I definitely think that, you know, what what we could say with with pretty good confidence is that there's strong evidence for for risk of psychological morbidity in, yeah. in this population these two populations mm. and it's probably underrepresented in in large data like this it would take you know it would take getting into the weeds and, and getting screening algorithms put into clinical care for people with cp and then we'll start to see the real like the, the real breadth of the issue mm. yeah mm -hmm. So, Mark, maybe we could talk uh, more specifically about some of the the results in this particular paper. Um, before we do that, though, I was hoping to ask you a little bit of a stats question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> given that you um, told us that you also now have a, a master's in biostatistics, so Love that. Um, <laughs> I feel confident in asking you this. Um, a lot of us, you know, as allied health clinicians are probably less familiar with uh, this concept of unadjusted and adjusted hazard ratios. So I was hoping you could maybe give us a little crash course in uh, those and, and how they work. Sure. Um, <laughs> so uh, a, ha a hazard model, which is a survival model, basically, mm. is, is, a, is a fancy regression model. And so if you know anything about like understanding correlation, this mm -hmm. is essentially a fancy version of that, okay. which is a, a, a regression model built on time series events. So mm -hmm. in this case, we have a we have a time which is a person is enrolled in a plan or if you if you start an intervention, for example, you mm -hmm. have a time zero and then you have a time in the future where you look at some outcome. In this case, the outcome was time to event for a specific a disease or a, a psychological outcome. Mm -hmm. And so when we have, when we have, when we have two things, which is the exposure variable, we call it the exposure variable. The exposure variable is having CP or not having CP, mm -hmm. or in this case, having CP or spina bifida or not having CP or spina bifida. Mm -hmm. And then we have a future event, which is, we'll just use depression as an example. Mm -hmm. If you have the ability to look at that one variable, so the unadjusted exposure association between CP and spina bifida and mm -hmm. depression, yeah. that's what you're going to look at. You're looking purely at the exposure variable, CP and spina bifida, or yeah. not CP or spina bifida on the outcome of interest, which is depression. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so, so we know that there is risk for people with CP and spina bifida to develop depression at a higher rate than people without CP and spina bifida. Mm. But there are other things that might contribute to developing depression, right? Mm -hmm. So it could be something like socioeconomic status. Yeah. Uh, it could be race. It mm. could be, you know, there's other factors, yeah. uh, income, education. So there's other factors that can contribute to disease. And mm. in this case, non-communicable diseases, especially in the United States. I, I mean, I don't know if it's like this in Australia, mm. but uh, sociodemographic variables are extremely, extremely robust predictors mm. of non-communicable disease, like yeah. obesity related metabolic and cardiovascular disease. Yeah. So, so we can look at, we can look at the unadjusted risk of having a certain condition mm. on that outcome in the future. But it's also important to understand, <clears throat> even after adjusting for some of these other important variables, does that risk still stand? Mm. And in this case, obviously we wanted to know if having CP or spina bifida, even after adjusting for everything in, in, in the kitchen sink, basically, yeah. I mean, we tried to put everything we could think of wow. into the model that would potentially adjust away um, the, the signal for CP and spina bifida. Wow. 
because that maybe that isn't inherently a risk factor for developing a, a, an outcome like depression. Yeah. Um, could it be that some of this other stuff explains away the the the, the essentially the variance in the outcome? Mm-hmm. And, 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 and in in no cases did that happen. I mean, we shot we found that <laughs> the the hazard ratio in this case the the survival of these um, these outcomes were were as stable as they were when we did not have an adjustment at all. Yeah. And so even after adjusting for all the things we thought could wow. potentially confound yep. um, mm-hmm. the association between CP and the outcome, they, they, they just didn't. Wow. wow. That's really interesting. And yeah. thank you for explaining that because yeah. I think it, it's not a, um, it's not a common thing that we would often see as Ash said, but um, the fact that you could explain it and we can understand it says yeah. you know a lot about it. I think well. it's quite a powerful way it of is. presenting yeah. that information. So, so as well. another way of yeah. another way of another way of looking at this is we did a similar study in spinal cord injury patients. Right. And when we put pain into the model, it explained more of the variance and the dependent mm-hmm. variables of psychologic morbidity than the actual exposure variable of spinal cord injury. Wow. So pain seems to be a heavy, heavy, heavy confounding factor, um, or in this case, a covariate in a model. Mm. That was not the case when we, when we modeled CP in, in spina bifida. It, mm. That preserved um, the, the robust association between the exposure variable and the outcomes mm. were all preserved, even after adjusting for everything else. So let's talk about some of the um, the main findings and I think you know we've we've touched on kind of the the key finding yes. there but some of the other um, things that were unpacked in this paper as well um, you found uh, that there was a higher four-year incidence of, of psychological morbidity uh, and that was a clinically meaningful difference wasn't it yeah and so it's important when you do large data work which we include that many people, about mm-hmm. thousands and millions of people in the control group. It's, a, it's really important to have a measure of effect in addition to a p-value be, because, I mean, a p-value is essentially meaningless when you have thousands and thousands, mm. thousands of people um, where the power in the statistics is um, uh, you, could, you could show a significant difference with a 0.1% difference in yeah. groups. And that does not mean anything, actually. Mm. And so we, we, create, we create a way to, using an effect size calculation, we create a way to detect whether or not the differences are actually you know, quote unquote, clinically meaningful to an mm. extent that we would say, yes, there is definitely a, a, a big difference between these two groups. Mm. Um, and, and that was and that was the case across, I think, across the board. Well, I think that's really interesting to, I guess, talk about, you know, that the extent of which this is clinically meaningful. And, mm. you know, basically what we are saying is that, you know, we've got um, adults with cerebral palsy and spina bifida have this high risk of psychological mm. morbidity. And I guess the next question from there is, you know, what can we do about it? You mm. know, and, and I think you've just sort of said it's probably an underestimation given sort of that the size of, of the problem as well. You know, what are your thoughts on that? You know, what, what does this data mean for, for you? And as, as a research team, yeah, it's. I mean, that's like the the, the best question you could possibly ask mm-hmm. because we don't have we don't have a great infrastructure of clinical um, uh, special specialists here in the United States or wor- worldwide. Frankly, I mean, I talk to to people from all over the place, and they mm-hmm. say, you know, we don't have great behavioral interventionists. We don't have great psychologists who have expertise in CP or spina bifida, mm-hmm. um, and so we, we have to take a top down and bottom up approach where we have to educate future doctors, we have to educate current doctors, but we also have to inform public policy that helps with coordination of care, especially after the transition from childhood. But I also think that we have a, we have a, we have a time now that we know that this is an issue. It's probably not arising in adulthood. It may be starting in childhood. And so having an infrastructure that allows for pediatricians to work together with clinical um, psychologists is, is, is in my mind, a very good way that we could prevent some of this from happening. Yeah. I mean, it, the medical model is such that once something is broken, we fix it. But really, we should, uh, as we should, we should try to prevent all of these things from happening in the first place. Yeah. And so it's much easier to prevent diabetes than to treat diabetes. It's much easier to prevent mental health disorders than to treat them. Mm. And I and I just I just for one think that this is probably something that should be addressed early in life um, yeah. by 
you know, engaging parents, engaging pediatricians, engaging mm. community members, engaging other stakeholders that that can help to galvanize um, and, and bring the information to folks so that they have an awareness around this. Because CP, there's so many orthopedic conditions and spastic things that are taken mm. care of and thought of, and no one considers the rest of the body and that the yeah. rest of the body is, yeah. is, is all happening at once too. Yeah. I think that's some incredible food for thought for a lot of the clinicians who are listening to this podcast and also working with uh, these populations in, in childhood and adolescence, Mark. So what would uh, your advice be for those people who are working with these families and do perhaps have that opportunity yeah. to to be involved and, and intervene and address some of these um, issues earlier? You know what I would say is I think that the best thing that we can do is we can we we can we can engage especially engage parents but also engage folks living with CP to be a, their own best advocates. Mm. Um, and obviously, I would love to say. We got to train all of the doctors. We got to train. We we need to train politicians to understand, but that's a really long road, mm -hmm. um, and and and, it, and it's going to take an extremely long time in order to change yeah. clinical practice yeah. and to train clinical practice guidelines. So we need to add. We need to help people to advocate for themselves. Yeah. And if that means if that means providing them toolkits and providing them information and, and leaflets and things that they should be able to bring to their providers, mm. to me that's like a very easy way that we could get started with this because because otherwise it's going to take it's going to take an exceptionally long time to yeah, change the medical right. establishment. Yep. Yep. Um, and, and to try to like engage with psychologists and psychiatrists who've never even heard of cerebral palsy. Mm. I mean, this is, this is yes. a hard road. So yeah. Yeah. we, we should start by helping folks, um, yeah. to understand what it is that they should expect when they, you know, they grow up basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's a, maybe the first line. Yeah. Mm. And even just hearing you talk about that in my head, I'm already thinking of all the, the shift there is in how we are viewing therapy. We know we have mm -hmm. the ICF. We've got the F words and we're really starting to shift and think about things like participation mm. and really thinking about how we, you know, we know that being belonging in a community, being yeah. able to participate, being active contributors, having a great sense of self, mm. you know, confidence, you know, those things are all going to be contributing factors that we can really support young people, yeah. which will help them to advocate for themselves in the future. But we also just know that things like finding opportunities to exercise mm. or exercise with friends. We yeah. know that exercise has great benefits from a musculoskeletal perspective, mm. but from a mental health perspective, that's also really significant as well. Yeah. You know, what, what do you think about that? I mean, I, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And we have now platforms. I mean, you guys, this is a perfect example. Your, your podcast and what you're doing with your program that didn't exist 10 years ago. We, yeah. we have social media influencers now with mm. CP that I am like yeah. so blown away by the <laughs> courage that they represent and and honestly those those people are going to probably make more of a change and difference than i will as a researcher i mean that's so critical these 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 opportunities to influence and and, ca and get gathers and, and get folks engaged is, is going to have a much bigger effect than publishing a paper in a medical journal you know yeah. and those those take that takes a very very long time to to actually see traction. So yeah, yeah I, I, I think that you guys are doing a great service to the community by having, by having this, this podcast and, and engaging folks. Oh, thanks, Mark. I mean, we love doing it and, yeah. and we've been learning so much from it. And, and I guess, you know, in the last few episodes, we've been talking a little bit about, you know, you know, you have these buzzwords in research from time yeah. to time, but sometimes those buzzwords are, they're, they're important and they're for a reason, yeah. but these authentic partnerships and co-designing research mm. where it's not just a token involvement of consumers in research and it's not just, you know, something that ticks a box, it's real. So that's how you can really bridge that gap between, you know, doing a research paper and and making it live you know in, in the world that we actually want it to so I feel like you've just described that you know essentially really really yeah. well yeah. <laughs> well, yeah highlighting that yeah mm -hmm. and I think um you know building on that Dana we talk a lot about meaningful change and I think you've hit the nail on the head there Mark yeah. is that you know we need the the people that we're working with to be involved in any you know any knowledge products or, or tools that are going to come out to ultimately help them and, and improve what you've highlighted in this paper. Yeah. Um, so Mark, yeah. can I ask you another yeah, question? Yeah, I certainly think it's – no, sorry, go ahead. No, it's okay. I just got another question just following on for that. Um, 
you know, you've spoken a fair bit about pain as well, just previously, just on that. Um, and I guess my, my sort of thought about that is when we're seeing kids and we're treating kids and they do report pain, it's, mm. we do need to take it seriously and we need yeah. to find ways that we can treat it or support them because that has a big effect on them long term. Like, you know, we talked about the centralized pain mm. um, earlier, that how you included it. Yeah, and, and honestly, what, what I think what has happened is that pain has become so normalized in CP, mm, and that's, yeah, yeah. some adults don't even report having pain. And, 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 and we know that adults with CP, and probably 100% of adults with CP experience pain, but they have, they have, they have sort of folded into their, their daily life as a normal byproduct of having CP. Mm. So, but what happens is we, we don't, we don't treat it properly mm -hmm. or in this, in many cases in the United States, it's being treated with narcotic medication and opiates. Yeah. And so it can potentially worsen the problem that we are worried about, which yeah. is mental health disorders. Yeah. So pain, pain management is, is aging and pain management seems to be the one and two, maybe mm -hmm. in that order. Um, and then mental health, third mm -hmm. uh, thing, priority items that adults with CP, at least in the United States, are reporting to be top priorities. Yeah. Yeah. So, Mark, to, to kind of wrap all this up, where to from here? I know you're an incredibly busy person and you have, you know, <laughs> many different research projects probably <laughs> going on at the moment. Where does this work take you now? Yeah, I, I have just recently agreed to and am committed to uh, writing with international help, <laughs> the first ever clinical practice guideline for adults with CP. <sighs> and um, the irony is not lost on me that I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a scientist <laughs> going to write the first ever, ever clinical practice guideline, but it needs to be done. And I'm, I'm tired of just doing research for the sake of doing research. It needs to, it, this needs to happen. It needs to be uh, a toolkit that can be given to all providers worldwide um, who, if they happen to have an adult with CP come into clinic, they will have a guidebook by which and, and, and toolkit by which they can Amazing. help the individuals yeah. prevent, you know, non-communicable disease that doesn't necessarily um, um, uh, sidestep what the ICF framework is, but it, it just takes into consideration the entire person, the entire yeah. body, the whole system in, mm -hmm. in, in, in the context of just health and longevity and well-being. And so I, I'm, I'm starting to do that. I have signed the contract and we'll wow. be doing that in the next couple of years. We will hopefully have a fully vetted clinical practice guideline for adults with CP that spans head to toe. Um, oh, and wow. will, incredible. Um, be, be something that hopefully will help lots of people in the future. Gosh, that's so exciting. Yeah. Thank you for sharing well, that with us. Yeah. You will have to come back once that's all finished yep. and, and talk <laughs> us through <laughs> what you learned yeah, from I would that. Love to. Oh, yeah. That'd be so would love good. To. So good. Well, we're we're about to sort of wrap it all up, but before we wrap it up, of course, we have the most popular segment, which is called Tell It to Ed. Ed, as you know, is our producer. He doesn't have a background in child health, but he has been listening very keenly in this conversation. So welcome to the show ed hi hi <laughs> it's good to have you here <laughs> um so mark in about 60 seconds or so can i get you to sort of summarize a body of research that we just spoke about then <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> i just realized how big that was no pressure <laughs> and then ed in turn will have an opportunity to ask you a question so take it away mark okay no problem so um <laughs> So for Ed, um, so a lot of the work that I do is related to how folks living with cerebral palsy experience health outcomes and health disparities across the rest of their life. Cerebral palsy has been historically treated as a child disability or a pediatric disability, um, but lo and behold, kids with CP do grow up, um, and there happens to be more people with CP who are adults than there are children, at least in the United States. Mm. And so it, it is actually really important that we consider the health outcomes for adults with CP as well. And in fact, I've had many adults with CP tell me that their general practitioners tell them they can't have CP because they are an adult. Um, and so it's, it's been my focus of research. It's been my focus of work and, and quite frankly, my motivation for my career to try to help people with CP across the lifespan. Um, and this has come from um, the origins of my work being in musculoskeletal um, 
areas, uh, how, to, how, how, how to help people preserve muscle and bone. And it has gone into other organ systems, including the, the heart, especially in the respiratory um, system. But then now most recently has been um, inclusive of mental health and psychological health and how we can not just um, diagnose, but also screen and potentially prevent um, negative health outcomes and in, in mental health outcomes physical and mental health outcomes for adults with CP and other pediatric onset disabilities. That was a wonderful wow. summary. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mark. That was so good. All right, Ed, over to you for a question. <laughs> um, I think I've done well to, to kind of keep up, um, but um, I, I've been really interested to, to listen to all this, um, this talk about um, CP and, and the mental health aspect of it, um, which correct me if I'm wrong, is, is what the psychological morbidity is about? Yes. All right, fantastic. I have kept up. <laughs> okay. um, so th there, was a, there was a point in the conversation where you were talking about um, uh, patients um, being, being advocates for themselves and, um, and, and to be their own best advocate. And then there was talk about um, like the authentic co-design and, and what the response from professionals is. And so... I guess my simplistic uh, question is: is where does this where does this actually begin to change the cycle of things? So, is it is it about empowering patients to uh, learn how to advocate for themselves, or or is it is it better for a professional to be better educated to be able to take on this this kind of uh, this viewpoint, or or is it a combination of the two? That wasn't simplistic. Yeah, <laughs> so sorry. That was, uh, <laughs> Ed, may I call you Edward? That was not yeah. simplistic at all. <laughs> because, because that was that was really pro that was actually quite profound. I mean, it's it's really both. It has to be both. We. Yeah. I don't ever blame patients for not knowing what they need, mm -hmm. but in this case, in this case, the clinicians do not know what they're doing. When, when adults with CP come into yeah. clinic. Yeah. I don't care if it's a large institution or a, a, a doc in the box in rural upstate Michigan. It, they don't know what CP is if it's a 30, 40, 50 year old adult with CP. So what mind. that means yeah. is we have, to do, we have to do both, honestly. We have, to add, we have to help the patient to understand what their unique needs are. Mm. But at the same time, we have to we have to improve the, the education of the medical establishment and actually hire up 30,000 foot view or whatever the 10,000 meter view <laughs> needs to be. There has to be change in policy yeah. and infrastructure yeah. that allows for better coordination of care and reimbursement strategies that help with providers connecting people with CP and other childhood onset disabilities to other providers that know something about it. Yeah. Because right now what's happening is I'm getting an influx of emails from people all over the world saying, I live in upstate Minnesota, or I live in Nevada, or I live in the UK. Could mm. you help me find somebody who knows something about CP? Wow. So we have to do both. And, and it may take, it may take, it may take the folks with CP educating the doctors. Yeah. That's the sad scenario yeah. that we're actually faced with. Um, but in the meantime, I mean, the, the research is important, but we have to help to advocate mm. to help people be uh, the best advocates for themselves. So, mm. I mean, that's an extremely profound uh, question and really, really um, important thing that we have to get a bunch of people in the same room on the same page yeah. and to move that in the right direction. So yeah. I appreciate that question. Ed. Yeah. Yeah, that was a good question. Yeah. And I'm not sure if you heard us gasp. I think yeah. Ash and I both gasped when you said that uh, doctors are saying that they you know, can't, you can't have, have CP because you're an adult. That's That just, yeah. yeah, blows my mind. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. That's a bit of weird. Yeah, I've heard that more than once. And actually, I've gotten that review from a mainstream medical journal that you, you couldn't be possibly doing work in CP if you're doing oh. stuff in adults. Oh. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like so fired, fired up. Fired up. Yeah. For, I can for, imagine. For, for that reason. <laughs> yeah, and I think the the other important um, point to to Ed's question and and your answer as well, Mark, is that um, it has to be multifaceted, and we have to come at it from 
kind of lots of different angles because not everyone with cerebral palsy has the the means to be able to advocate for themselves. You know, we're talking about, um, you know, a proportion of people who are nonverbal yeah. and, um, you know, may not have the the means to, to have the, you know, the, the devices or the ability to communicate those messages that they, you know, around pain, around mm. mental health, mm-hmm. around all these, um, you know, issues that they're facing. So, um, yeah, I feel like that's just, we need to come at it from as many different angles as we yeah, can. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh gosh. Like we could talk to you for a long time. It is the beginning of the day for us, but it's about time for you to probably go to sleep. <laughs> yeah. Now. So Mark, we, yeah, we you thank guys, you. You guys have gotten me pacing around my house. Oh. Now, so <laughs> you need to wind down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you yeah, so, so much. much for joining us on the show, Mark. We've absolutely enjoyed. We we're looking forward to speaking with you and we've just loved the opportunity to speak with you about this topic. And, you know, as you can hear, we're all very passionate about yeah. it. And, um, you know, to all our listeners, remember you can, have access to the paper that we spoke about through our website researchworks.net and remember there's a CPD form there that you can fill out as well if you want to keep this as a record of your PD um, but for now not that I want to say goodbye but I guess we have to thank you so much so, so, so much Mark and um, I hope we can speak to you again really soon no thank you guys so much it's been really a nice honor and again the the opportunity is rare for for this type of conversation so thank you so much oh no it, it's yeah it's such a privilege for us to be able to to have you on today mark we really appreciate yeah. it thank you all to all of our listeners thanks for tuning in and we'll talk to you all again next week bye, bye.